I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And I'm Parasim. And it's Return of the Disembodied <clears throat> Clapping. <laughs> Tonight, we're finally finishing our discussion of Mass Effect 3 because Pixie found time to finish the game. It only took me like a month, but yes, I managed to do it. Woohoo! No, no. Pixie has finally finished Mass Effect, and what that really means is that we're going to spend almost all of this show talking about these super cool glow-in-the-dark Canadian dinosaur quarters. Dude, I'm so excited about these Canadian quarters. I'm not even Canadian and I want this money. Dinosaurs! They glow in the dark? Completely inaccurate dinosaurs. So the next time someone walks up to you and goes, dinosaurs aren't real, you just go like, I got a quarter that says they are. So when you and when you're looking at them in the light, they look like a dinosaur with skin and bow and meat and stuff. But then when you're looking at them at glow in the dark, they're a skeleton. Because when I think about dinosaurs, the first thing that comes to my mind, Canada. The quarters you buy them for thirty dollars, and then they're actual quarters, so you could spend them in vending machines. So if I lived in Canada, I might consider spending $30 on a dinosaur quarter and then using it to buy a Coke in a vending machine. In Canada, you can, in fact, get a Coke for a quarter. Well, I guess there is American currency that is sold as collector's items like that. You could spend his money. Right, the the ones that are advertised on, like, the high-end channels at stupid o'clock in the morning. Oh, whatever. I'm just fucking with you guys. Let's talk about Mass Effect. You could have the silver dollar for $50. It... It, it's not really worth anything, but we'll tell you it is. Anyway. So Mass Effect. Actually, um, <clears throat> I, I'm going to correct something in your notes here, so you can go ahead and get started. We finally finished the game, and so we're going to give a bit of perspective on the endings. Now, I'd like to preface this by saying none of us are particularly enraged, as much of the internet community is, just kind of confused and speculating like, well, everyone else at the moment. Well, I was satisfied with the ending in a lot of ways, and also dissatisfied in a few ways. I would have liked a few things to be better, but on the whole, I was pretty satisfied with it. Which is impressive, considering you had a substantially darker game than the rest of us. Only in one way, really. I don't know that I had anything happen other than the death of Tally and all the Quarians, which admittedly is pretty bad. It's but pretty big. Well, did just... you go to the dance party on Thessia after you saved the planet? Uh, no. Uh, again, substantially darker, and... <laughs> And did did you bake a cake for Tali? No. See? Because Tali uh, was dead in your game. Tali and Garrus did not hook up in my game. Pieces of Tali might have. Uh, I, I assume you're going to stick a spoiler tag in front of this, right? <laughs> totally. I'm, I'm actually kidding. There's no way to save Thessia, no matter what you do. And the dance party was unfortunately very depressing, because the only one who Because Shepard Javik. can't dance. Shepard Everybody can't dance, Shepard and, and Javik's just too awkward to try. I don't know. Did you <clears> see Jack dancing? I'd argue she can't either. <laughs> Yeah, but if you tell her that, she'll crush your skull. Worth the risk. So, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I think we should all introduce what... Which colored explosion did we get first off? Um, I did synthesis, which is white, I believe. Green. 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 That is the green explosion, where you linked everything in the universe to a new 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 structure of life. We made a new kind of life by melding all of the organics with synthetics and the synthetics with organics, and we created a new DNA, So does and this, this is the next step in evolution. Does this mean that all of the species of the universe can technically reproduce now? You know, maybe. That That's an interesting point. How much did we just alter DNA? I don't care. Because I'm thinking a, a, not a, bad thing. a Krogan-Turian hybrid would be kind of frightening. The more genetic <clears throat> diversity, the better the propagation of the species. Remember, that's what makes humans so hardy. Right. And also why, you know, banging your cousin's a weird... That's not a good thing if you want to keep the species going. The British royal family is proof of this. Aww. The implication at the end of the synthesis ending is that Joker and Edie are totally going to have, like, regular oh, old-fashioned sex. Yeah. And that's kind of weird. Edie cause... probably has a port. She is built for realism. Yeah, but Joker still has brittle bone syndrome. <laughs> Maybe we fixed that with yeah, the Yeah, we might have just ending. cured that. We might have just fixed it by reinforcing his bones with, like, nanites or whatever. Again, speculation. Awesome. Totally if, worth it. If we did just upgrade all of life, chances are it's going to fix the imperfections. I mean, after all, even Cerberus <clears throat> managed to upgrade him a little bit. Right. He still nearly broke his arm when Edie grabbed it in the game, though. Mm. Which could be a solution to the starvation problem with the mass relay is being destroyed, because... If the Quarians and Turians have human DNA, then maybe they can eat human food. Oh. The problem is that the, the Earth can't they, support they them now. They don't have human... Well, I guess they do, because you're human, and you just spread yourself out to everybody, basically. Again, the, 
the there statements were not of the catalyst imply that everything will have all DNA. So everything well, the, the will be part Geth and part is that You will put your own energy into the machine and spread it out. And that will, you know, make everything partly synthetic and partly organic. It didn't say explicitly human, but I guess that since you're putting yourself in there and you are human, that, that could be interpreted. I, I will say the watching chain this reaction ending... will combine all synthetic and organic life into a new framework. And so it all, everything is going into that melting pot. All synthetic and organic life. Right. Uh, uh, that doesn't make sense to me because you're you're basically firing one end of a gun. It's not like we mixed everything together in a pot. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Is we put you, we loaded you into this barrel and we shot you out. That that uh -huh. makes sense to me. <laughs> we got well, your. I, I got to figure everything. that the yeah. crucible is sufficiently powerful that it can do just about anything. It, 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 it did have to blow up all device. of the relays to do this. That's a lot of energy. So, so I, I guess we can move on. Uh, well, it had to get your goo <clears throat> everywhere. <laughs> right. I went for the control ending because I didn't see fundamentally altering existence itself without anyone's permission as Evolution a good solution. Evolution doesn't ask for your permission. <laughs> right. <laughs> Likewise, I didn't see killing my friend Edie and the Geth for the sake of getting rid of the big scary monsters as an acceptable option. That There's just no makes joke. you the same as the elusive man, though. There's no joke about evolution that says, if humans evolved from apes, why are they still apes left? And the, the answer is, some of them got a choice. <laughs> so, yeah, I agree that going into that option, I felt like I was letting the or making the elusive man's argument. But I ended up sitting here for 15 minutes thinking about what you answer I wanted. validating his, like, really horrible, fucked up experiments. I think the difference that I saw for myself was what we were both planning to do by doing this. Mm -hmm. He wanted to take control of the Reapers to use them as a weapon and a tool. And for him I to then personally become right. king of the galaxy. Right. I wanted to use them to get them to stop killing my friends and get he the fuck out of my galaxy. He was humanity's best interests at heart. Yeah, humanity. He did not have Turian best interests at heart yeah. one little bit. Or Corian or Asari. No. I wanted to take control of the goddamn thing so that I could go, get out. You're done. No more playtime. Go home. In time, we might think about doing more with them, but for now, get the fuck off Earth is a good enough description. And that's what I did. I took control of them, and they flew away, leaving a bunch of soldiers to think, did, did we win? Except you just left the Torians and the Torians to starve to death. And... Speculation? No, because... In your ending, they don't have that fancy new DNA that means that they can eat human food. <laughs> Speculation. You don't have any confirmation of them starving to death. Uh, I know that they can't eat human food. Okay. And I know that the mass relays are destroyed. And I know that they can't go home to get their food. <laughs> and what part of the video showed a Quarian and Turian sitting together going, you know, it'd be great. Some food. We'd really like some food. You can extrapolate that from the fact that they're going to need to eat eventually, being organic. And that they all came to help you out at Earth. All of them. That is the all of them. There aren't any hiding somewhere else. Oddly enough, Although, the, the, really, the Quarians, the Quarians wouldn't starve have to death because they brought all their stuff with for them. For a long time now. Right. And the they still have their fine. live ships with them. But what about the Turians? Maybe the Quarians can produce Turian food on their live ships. Yeah, I, I would assume that th food. you realize they have a finite number of resources. No, because most spaceships by then would be able to create sustainable food for their crews. D yeah. uh, for just their crews. Remember, the Corian's fleets sustain themselves off of the resources brought back from the people coming back on pilgrimage. Right. They go forth, they bring back resources. That's their big thing. If they're stuck in one spot, they're screwed. Mm -hmm. But also, they're not quite stuck on Earth. They're stuck in the local cluster, because yeah. already the local cluster mass relay was, like, hundreds of light years away from Earth. So they right. have access to everything in the Sol system and everything in Which, the other solar systems in the local cluster. Plus yeah, all the local of the cluster engineering also doesn't have any other of the inhabitable Turian and planets and Geth fleets. No, because I read a, there were tons of human colonies in the Sol system. But we've at least been to Mars and the Moon. Yeah. Because we've artificially built stuff there, though. Uh, I'm saying the idea that they all starved to death is just as much speculation as the concept that, oh yeah, the Mass Effect relays could be rebuilt. We don't have proof of any of it in any direction, because the ending is so damn ambiguous. I think 
everything in life is ambiguous to a certain right. degree, but I think we can have a pretty significant degree of confidence that the, the, the one thing that we know us. is life continued because we still have the old man and the grandson. Human life. Oh yeah, human life is just fine, which the elusive man would be like, win! <laughs> Although, we don't know in the synthesis ending if that is humans or just uh, or the, life the forms evolution. that look like humans. Right. Well, we know they're mammals. <laughs> so I totally did not see the pun on shepherd and shepherd with two peas coming. I should have, but I didn't. What? Shepherd is the shepherd, like Jesus. She yeah. turns to that's, her flock. That's, you can't spell Pyro. <laughs> yeah, no, that there is no Shep difference between that character's and name. Shepard. Yeah, no, you, there there was definitely that um, Neither of those that have two play peaks. the entire game. Yeah. <laughs> like, Gratz, you are the new space messiah. You died, unless you were an asshole. Let's go to you, Pyro. Uh, you also <laughs> did synthesis? I also did synthesis. Um, yes, and I feel ambiguously about the control ending, because the control ending, I see two ways for that to go out in the long run. Because right. if the catalyst is speaking truthfully when it says that the created will always rebel against the creators, then by turning away the reapers, the only thing left to happen is for tensions to mount between Geth and organics until all on war breaks out and the Geth exterminate all organics. See, I kind of felt what you had actually done during the game was something that the Catalyst couldn't take into account for. Is that building you... solid relationships between synthetics and organics? And giving them independent mind. Like... The creator's definition of synthetics is of a linked mind, because it does the same thing with the Reapers. Edie pulls this up, too, uh, when she talks about the Geth and the Quarians conflict, when she's like, you know, the Quarians might have had better luck if they'd made the Geth more like them. Right. That part of the, their problems stemmed from them having that collective consensus mm -hmm. instead of being individuals. Yeah, so I felt that the moment you had freed the Geth, you created something that the creator could not account for. Uh -huh. You had done something unique enough that maybe it won't go that way. Um, the thing I was really worried about taking the creator ending, he said, try to take control of the Reapers, which was like, um, am I eventually going to get overthrown in this? But that bothered me. Mm -hmm. Well, but then again, the creator was ambiguous in all of the endings. I mean, in the Destroy ending, he said, no, this will probably kill you too, but we know if you get the absolute max ending that you don't. You live. Or at least you live long enough to take one breath of air. And then immediately croak. And it's then like... immediately die, because that breath of air was your uh, lungs minus cybernetic implants trying to gasp for oxygen and failing. And the camera cuts off, but, you know, the best ending is really just a red herring. You died a couple seconds later. It's no big deal. Yep. Uh, can, 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 I, can I branch out here? Absolutely. And, um, okay, so I'd, li I'd like to poll the two of you. Can we agree, then, that the destruction ending is just terrible? Like, that, that that's ethically something we wouldn't want to do, no matter what? The, the destruction moment... ending is pretty terrible. Yeah, the moment From they said standpoint. that you are killing Edie and the Geth, a race that you yourself just gave sentient life to... Mm -hmm. Additionally, you run into the rebellion problem in a much bigger way than you do even in the control yeah. ending because in the destruction ending some rogue faction is invariably going to invent new synthetics and right. they're not going to have the friendly relationship that you've carefully built up with the Geth over these three games. In the control ending if it happens to come down to you as Shepard in control of the Reapers decide that oh shit this is necessary you can do something about it. Right. Your consciousness is still in existence, just not in the form. I mean, there's nothing to say that you couldn't fly a Reaper up to Garrus and go, Hey, buddy, I'm still here. <laughs> Check out. Hell, in control of the Reapers, you could build yourself a new damn body. In control of the Reapers, you could just kill everything, and then I am queen of the galaxy. All right. this emptiness is mine to command. The Reaper, the and control ending is so goddamn open as to what you could have done afterwards that it makes... It, it's not complete enough. There's nothing to say Shepard just didn't build herself a new body, march back onto the Citadel and go, yo, I'm in charge of this bitch. Want to argue with my friends? That also sort of means that in the control ending, you have created hybrid life. Because yeah. the Reapers are big robots with an organic intelligence in control of them. 
in right. sort of a collectively networked way. They're they're networked, but so you by, make yourself synthetic. By, <laughs> by all means, the Reapers you make yourself have hybrid. independent personalities. And by being just... hybrid, you ascend above the conflict between synthetic and organic. And right. well, I mean, you started out as to... organic and made yourself synthetic, such. Uh huh. Anyway, um. But yes, I'm completely in agree with in agreement with you. The destruction ending is not ethically sound in any way. You didn't stop anything. Well, you stopped the Reapers temporarily, but the galaxy is probably going to blow itself up. You're going to kill all or the synthetics, the and then probably yeah. all the organics are going to die not too long after. Plus, Joker is going to be super depressed when Edie just falls over dead. He's going to be heartbroken. Right. Uh, just like, and have a crushed pelvis. Just what the hell was that? Don't like, everything was going that. fine. And I'm then glad you know that. They were fucking with the crucible fire. <laughs> there we go. No, so... we, we, we clearly know from the ending, Joker was running the fuck away from the battle at top speed. I, I'm glad that this is, like, before we go back to being syndicated on WLR. Right. Because we could not get away with this profanity there. <laughs> So where like, the heck was Joker going? What really? was yeah? What was Joker? He was trying doing to outrun the explosion, and I don't think it really mattered. But where. yeah, it didn't matter. He didn't need to blow up the Normandy by driving it too hard. The explosion didn't kill people. He didn't know that. He just went, "Oh shit, Giant there's an explosion! explosion. Run away. I'm going to run away from it." That's He's the way just I like, saw it. Okay, that's an explosion. I'm just going to smash my hand on this uh, jump He's drive like, button. I've and... I've got this. I've been running away from explosions in this ship for years. Whee! Basically, that's how I saw it. No need to stop and think about this for a second. Just go into jump drive right away and run away. I, I mean, how fast would Joker have needed to be fleeing before that explosion started? It was big enough to cover all of the universe once it hit the relays. Well, it, the problem is he was ju- running away from where it had touched one of the relays. And we established that the explosion itself did not hurt the people that it hit. Yeah, but he didn't know that. You're so expecting he to spread drove your sh- knowledge. He drove the ship so damn hard that he broke it. I imagine that, the other, if I remember correctly, the explosion caught up to him and shot him down over that yeah. land. But it didn't hurt people. The explosion, because of his expert flying skills. The explosion did not blow up any other ship that it hit. It didn't touch the fleet around Earth. Well, my How impression do we know that? of it that just cuts was, to him. and I have no justification for this. So what blew up this, the Normandy? The explosion imp- when it touched it. Okay, so the Normandy is the one ship in existence that actually got hurt by the blast because they were directly in the path being fired upon. Yes, because they were currently mass transporting. They, they were transporting here, and there's a laser beam here, and then it hits them, and they go down. So I apparently, the super is... concentrated form of the laser is the harmful version. And that was what I had got out of it. But every other version of this laser doesn't harm anything? Although we don't really see a whole ton of what happens to other ships. Yeah, it goes through them. We see it when the city, or when the catalyst explodes. Do we? Yeah, but we don't see... We see it for like a few seconds. We don't know what the long run there was. As maybe they all were unable to propel themselves away from gravity now, and they all were in orbit. Again, we don't have enough of the ending here. We are missing large chunks. Also, th- this is something I found interesting, because uh, I have watched all three endings. The synthesis is the only ending where Shepard seems at peace with what's going on. Because you just leap into the thing, and it's like, Shepard is just kind of smiling and dissolving. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, th- that's the one that the Catalyst has established. D- D- Shepard asks, and there will be peace, right? And the Catalyst goes, well, sure. <laughs> yeah, because when I did the uh, the control ending, I dissolved. I, like, watched myself burning to death from the inside out. Synthesis is also the ending that requires the highest military readiness to unlock, and therefore is just nominally the best ending. It's maybe not actually the best ending, but at least it requires the most readiness, and so ostensibly it's the best ending. Yeah. Uh, okay, we're watching the synthesis ending right now, and one thing that did really anger me about all three of the endings, why did it randomly pick the characters that it did to show me in the It didn't out? seem random. It did for me. Because, like... Oh, well, it was... Joker, who's in a relationship with a synthetic, and you're about to merge synthetic and organic life. No, but I saw Joker, too, in the control ending. And, and then Anderson, who's been, like, your father figure. 
And then Liara, who was, you know, my romantic partner in that. Yeah, you so know who I it saw? It made sense for me. <laughs> it didn't make sense for me, because you know who I got to see? Garrus. <laughs> it's like, here's your turn. <laughs> really? You're not going to show me Miranda, the person I'm in a relationship with? It, it just shows, like, the fanboy from the Citadel from Mass Effect 1 and the reporter you great. punched. Conrad! Conrad Werner is the best, you and know I'll what? fight you if you say otherwise. Just, just <laughs> let's go completely random. Um, show me me punching the reporter three times. <laughs> um, show just me... like a dubstep remix. It's just chopped and screwed footage of me right. punching the recorder. Show me Bar Levon. Or at least his corpse sitting on the Citadel. It just shows you dancing at, like, Afterlife. Now see, that that, that ship, that Reaper ship clearly got blown up there. Look at all these ships here getting blown up. Maybe this is one of the bad endings. This is the green one! <laughs> yeah, it's still possible to destroy the Earth in the green ending. If you don't, if you did not have Those enough. are Reapers, though. Well, yeah, have you seen the worst destroy ending? Where Earth itself gets just incinerated? I don't suppose I have, but I, I know it's it, possible from the list here. You see these soldiers just like, we're boned? Yeah, we're boned. So the quick distinctions See, between this ending and the uh, Deus oh, yeah, Ex Human Revolution the ending... They just got the synthetic thing. Well, there are a lot of superficial similarities between them. and This one, <laughs> sure. Down here, sure. These are flying away. But the ones up there, closer to the close. blast, which is what I was saying. Is that at close contact with the blast? It was too much? Mm -hmm. Well, here we go. We're actually at the ships in space. That tore through a few of them, see? Yeah. I guess the, the things The ones that... in direct contact with the blast. Let's see, that's blowing up, and... And so as it sends out the little shots to the relays... Yep. Stuff blows up that gets caught directly in the path. <laughs> Considering the relays. Also, I'm, I feel bad about giving these people hits. Yeah, I, I'm not 100% satisfied with the ending. I'm glad that they're... There's enough to on talk it. about it, and I'd say it definitely gives credit to the series. Do, do that I you think? Feel strongly about do it. I think that I got shafted, or that I didn't get the it's full it's experience of my like shepherd? His ship is going crazy, and there's stuff on fire. I think he's having problems. I think Joker just finally hit the point where it's like, nope, the warranty on the fire. Normandy is gone. Fire. <laughs> Normandy done ran out of warranty right there. See, blows up. I do have to wonder about the poor people that I took with me on that final mission. Or they just watch you, like, evaporate as you go up to the catalyst. I'm pretty sure I watched Edie and Liara get hit by it. Before ah. it hit me. Despite the fact that That's I saw... Funny, I took the same ones. Despite the fact that I saw Liara get out of the ship. Yeah, that confused me too. Right. Like, I took them with me, and then they're over here. <laughs> Which, like, unless you were on there for a really long time, it doesn't really tell you how much time has passed. They didn't tell you how, un how, how long you were unconscious on the planet, either, because I don't buy the indoctrination theory. Indoctrination I, I think that's people grasping way too hard. A theory that is applied to basically 100% of fiction. Look at him, there is not a around. fictional work that exists that doesn't have the fan eyes. theory mm -hmm. of it was all a dream and the main character's been dead all along and Deckard is a replicant. It's right. That that theory exists for all fiction. And so it's it's kind of worth discounting just because it's boring in that regard. Yeah, I I I think to go with the indoctrination theory, you are not giving any credit to the storytellers for being able to make a unique story. It's, it's just a, a fan now theory with that is synthetic. sort of interesting but also not true that is applied to every work. I mean, right. if you go to Wild Mass Guessing on TV Tropes for Star Wars, you'll find the theory that Luke died at the beginning of A New Hope, and it's all oh, just when, a death dream. Oh, when the, uh, when the sand person hit him? Yes. Nice. I mean, that theory exists for all fiction, so it's not, it's not interesting anymore. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I don't buy that at all. Am I, am I exactly happy with the ending? No, Sorry, what I, was I the TV it, Tropes thing you just quoted? Wild Mass Guessing. I, I would like more clarification. Apologies to anybody who just lost four hours of their life I, there. Mm. I don't like the fact that there is there has to be speculation about whether a large number of the universe's residents starved to death because the relays exploded. You know, I, I'm okay with them having blown up, but I, I would like some definition about how life got on in the universe. I would like to know more about what happened to my crew. 
especially considering they're now stranded on an alien world with little chance of rescue. I'm actually kind of okay with a lot of the ambiguity in the ending. The fundamental mystery of where did the Reapers come from and why are they doing what they're doing is pretty well answered. Yeah, and no, we, we've got that. The, the mystery is sort of There's good. literally a page, the, there's a page on Wild Mask Gussing for everything. Wow. Well, let me put it this way. Cl- classically, video game endings have been shit. Uh, uh, let's compare the Mass I Effect mean, 3 an ending MMO. to the Deus Ex I'm Human confused. Revolution ending. This is a comparison that has been made many times with good reason. And I think if you look closely at it, while they're sort of structurally similar, Mass Effect 3 comes up as way superior to Deus Ex Human yeah. Revolution. Because, for a couple of reasons. One of which is the endings for Human Revolution were super crappy. They, they were yeah. not like... But, video in 3D were of cut, the things happening after you made your footage. decision. It, it was, was just, stock footage of just things around the world. A clip show of irrelevant images with voiceover. Right. And then the three endings of Mass Effect actually do have sub-variations depending on your military readiness. So, while they're similar, there's actually like 18 endings more realistically to Mass Effect 3. Three broad categories, and then a bunch of sub-endings within them. Right. And uh, then... I, I will rank the ending of Mass Effect 3 above Human Revolutions, simply because your character interacted with it. The moment you push one of those buttons in Deus Ex, your character no longer mattered. Was not in any of the endings apart from the overarching narration. In Mass Effect, you actually did something. Whether it was, I'm going to grab these Reaper station controls, and they're going to dissolve my body so I can take control of them. Or I'm going to leap into this thing. Or, the classic way of doing it as Shepard, I'm going to shoot this thing. Uh-huh. I'm going to shoot it until it says, actually, I argue that your Shepard should have been able to biotically charge it. I didn't <laughs> try. <laughs> yep, if you're playing a Vanguard, instead of shooting the Reaper control, you should be able to biotically charge it. Just like, yeah, boom, broke it with my face. That, that would explain why I can headbutt Krogan with the best of them. Right. <laughs> Your shepherd has a very hard skull. From biotically charging it into everything. Right. I and run it into turrets, I run it into badgies, I run it into You have charged an atlas. I have I charged an you. atlas, I have charged a brute while it was charging me and killed it. You got an achievement for it. Yes. <laughs> After the Um, endings of Mass Effect, there is talk about how the galaxy proceeded and what they regarded Shepard as, as a result of this. I mean, the endings clearly state that Shepard has become mythological. Right. Which, in the end of Human Revolution, Adam Jensen is just like, oh, you're gone now. Yeah, you don't, no one knows who Adam Jensen is. The original Deus Ex starts and there is never any mention of him. He does not exist anymore. So, while that comparison has been made, and for some good reason, I I think Mass Effect 3 unambiguously has a a much stronger ending than Human Revolution. Which is good, because Human Revolution's ending was terrible. Yeah. No, that one was insulting. Hey, push one of these three buttons, or we've got a fourth one down the hallway. Uh, Another video game I wanted to compare Mass Effect 3 to, or the Mass Effect series to, is... I'm going to make you play a guessing game to figure out what video game this is. I'm going to describe it. No, I'm going to give you a description. There was an ancient civilization that created a a mechanism that destroyed all intelligent life to prevent a calamity from occurring, wherein a new kind of creepy form of life would destroy and dominate life as we know it. What's your guess? Damn it, it's Halo. Shut up. It's Halo. (laughs) The, The Mass Effect 3 story plot has a lot in common with the Halo story. I'd still argue it makes more sense than the Halo story. To me, the synthesis ending just made the most sense based on what you had been doing up to that point. Like, the, for example, you didn't have this in your ending, or in your story, so I'm going to explain this to you, Pyro. But if you get the Quarians and the Geth to work together, like, you go and talk to Tally about this later, the Geth are, like, rapidly helping them adjust to... Uh, life on Rannoch, and it accelerates their, 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 their the, the gather downing themselves as software into the Corian's life suits, and basically inoculating the Corians with, like, themselves 
as nanites as a way to jumpstart their immune system, they're basically giving them years of a head start. Uh huh. So it's it's just uh, like we've already and we've already got like synthetic modifications to organics through um, the, the the cybernetics that Cerberus outfitted you with when when it rebuilt you, which was admittedly fringe, very new technology, but yeah, it's I, doable. I, I, I kind of so wonder. it seemed like the natural progression of this is where we're going with things. I, I, I mean, saying you joke all the time about replacing your arm with a biotic one. It'd be nice. So it just seemed like the next step that oh, of course. Uh huh. I, I was kind of wondering initially when I had heard about Shepard being upgraded with cybernetics, well, why the hell don't the Quarians just do that? Give themselves cybernetic immune because systems and they'll be really fine. Fucking expensive, that's why. They could only do it once and after several billion credits I'm spent. sure the entire Quarian civilization can come up with some money for that. It was experimental right. even when they were doing it to Shepard. And they only right. did it to Shepard because she was already dead. I was like, there's nothing to lose She at was that clinically point. brain dead and everything, so yeah. <laughs> Meat and tubes, as Jacob describes it. So she was very experimental in that regard. Uh, I just wanted to ask the creator child, is is there any way we can do this where Jacob Taylor doesn't survive? And everyone <laughs> I, else I want, does? I want every intelligent entity in this galaxy to survive except for that Jacob, Jacob Taylor. Taylor. <laughs> I, I want the femshep who I mean, gets I've had slighted by Jacob where I to be just able pulled to out say my that. sidearm and shot him in the head, but instead I want to use the crucible to destroy him. Yep, that that's what I want the femshep who gets dumped by Jacob in Mass Effect 3 to do. Just it's like It all led spiteful. to this. It all led to the moment she declares, can you kill Jacob Taylor? Well, well, I guess he was on the Citadel. Yes. The Geth Actually, synthesizing no, with you can the Orions to improve their immune system seems like the synthesis ending writ small without the use of the Crucible. And if synthesis can be achieved without the Crucible, then that sort of seems like control is the best ending. Because that means even if it is true that synthetics and organics can never get along, you could go control, uh, keep all of the life forms you have, and then create hybrids the old-fashioned way without using the catalyst. And then those hybrids will ascend past the organic-synthetic conflict. Cause right. You, you're not, they're not going to fight with themselves. Because they're one entity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I see what Pix was saying, though, that, you know, if you do the control ending, you are kind of justifying everything the elusive man said. You're just being better about it. That, that or almost doesn't seem like a problem to me, because, I mean, hey, I guess the elusive man was kind of right, partially. And you were being partially pig-headed throughout the whole game. He's and maybe still the kind of a chick cooperated, but... You know, maybe all of his ideas weren't completely terrible. I don't know, I did convince him to shoot himself, which I high-fived myself about. <laughs> that was the one reputation check that I saw and was unable to pass and was grayed out for me. I was super nope. disappointed by it. I got him to shoot himself in the head, and I'm like, ha, I win. I don't even care about getting him to shoot himself <laughs> in the head, but up until that, like, last five minutes of the game, I thought they had done away with needing to have your points high enough to have certain dialogue options. Nope, that is the last thing in Mass Effect that requires your points. Actually, I remember specifically, Pix texted me regarding one of her renegade options that she picked. Which one? Uh, the end of Kai Lang. Ah. Which, I, I have to admit, I went for this renegade option too, because it was so damn cool. It was really cool, but I felt it was... It, it, I explicitly did it for the closure for that the romance line. arc. See, it yeah. wasn't even a romance arc. For me, because Thane was my friend. For me, Thane was... I felt like Thane. my shepherd is a crazy practical tactician, and right. leaving Kai Lang alive can only result in Kai Lang escaping and then hampering my plans some more. Yeah, I, I was kind of wondering, what are you doing letting him just lay there? That This is not a good option. Turn around and shoot him in the head. Clearly, he's shown time and again that he is a credible threat to my objectives, so I want to neutralize that threat. Yeah, no, the, this guy needed to die. But still, being able to turn around and watch Shepard break his sword using his or her fist. Now, for a biotic, this might be less impressive, because you can already crush cars using your mind. For me to turn around as a soldier and bust that sword by punching fist. it, I felt pretty epic. Pretty hardcore. Right, and then I shanked him with my combi blade. 
Of course. Uh, no, that, 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 you know, turning around and going, that was for Thaney, son of a bitch, made total sense for her because she was romantically involved with that. Yeah, no, I used the same line. Because yep. he was my friend. Because I can't that turn around and go, lizard. that was for Miranda, you son of a bitch. I didn't do anything to Miranda. Well, I know. No, she brings him up, so. Well, yeah, but he doesn't manage to ever hurt her. That you know of. She despises him, she knows who he is, but... She said that I've avoided him this thus far. And then so she says that, you know, Slimy whatever is still alive. Like, mm -hmm. she's surprised. So she might have fought him off before. Right. But. There's but a I mean, particularly we... impressive Thane cosplay at PAX East, by the way. There were some really impressive Mass Effect cosplayers in general. Including, you know, the, the woman who plays uh, Samara, who's totally cheating by cosplaying herself. <laughs> That she actually has blue blue skin and head tails IRL. No, but her Samara's face is modeled on hers. Uh huh. It would be like the the actress who played Miranda showing up dressed in Miranda's suit. Is Miranda's she looks butt like that. After that actress, I could only hope so. <laughs> it's real. I'm sorry, it's impossible to take any cutscene with Miranda seriously because the camera will accurately position itself to highlight her butt and Shepard <laughs> in every angle. <laughs> it's like Miranda's on this computer talking to you, and there's Miranda's butt taking up the entire right side of the screen, and then there's just Shepard standing off to the left. It's Miranda there, there's sitting your in a chair. Samara's the face, Samara the slash Moore's just... face model. There you go. Yep. Oh, she's Miranda also the voice sitting in a voice. chair, and the camera is no clipped through the bottom of the chair, like inside geometry, just for the purpose of being able to get a good shot of her butt. Here's Miranda's butt. Now, the Morden cosplay in this post, which I will post under the video, seems like the head is shaped a little funny. And also, that that tally does not seem fat, but there's like a lot of cardboard bulk on that tally costume. Right. They have a fully active grunt head. <laughs> that one's pretty hardcore. Right. Like, Thane is the most realistic looking of the Thane is buttons. pretty awesome. So, um, new free DLC ending good. coming, where they say they're going to adhere to the creative integrity of the existing ending and provide additional information. Yep, I'm okay uh, with that. This sounds like the perfect behavior yeah. on Bioware's part from my perspective. Yeah, those people who are making demands and sending tainted baked goods to Bioware. Yeah. What? Is that actually a thing? You didn't hear about the 400 cupcakes? No, I did not. Okay, so we'll, we'll go over this. Um, I'm the, going to have to Google this. The Retake Mass Effect initiative decided that the proper way to get Bioware to give in to their demands was to send them 400 cupcakes with a snide message. So, by tainted, I mean by the message. The cupcakes were perfectly fine, because rather, okay. than, rather than accepting the cupcakes, Bioware decided that they would donate them. The cupcakes did not have strychnine and razor blades inside right. them. No, but they, they sent them with this message. Uh, no matter what color you choose, they all taste the same. Which is really insulting. That's slightly clever wording. So they, ha they had cupcakes colored like the endings. Yep. Like that's that's kind of clever. Douchey. Incredibly yeah, douchey. Yeah, it's incredibly... But kind of clever. It's incredibly douchey. 402 cupcakes. I, I think they had a count of the number of Bioware employees. He raised the money he needed in under an hour. <laughs> yep. Um, so Bioware, deciding that they didn't want to accept these cupcakes that were created with malicious intent... The idea is that the cupcakes would somehow communicate the notion of lack of choice in the endings to Mass Effect. Proposed messages for the box include, no matter what color you choose, it's all vanilla. <laughs> they they went with the first one. There, It has since been delivered. The Forbes article that you're looking at is just older. The cupcakes themselves will be a mix of red, blue, and green. So, they, if I remember correctly, they ended up donating them to the city's boys club. Boys club totally sounds like a gay sex brothel. No, it's not. Oh. It's like the YMCA. Which, mm. <laughs> it's fun to Again. say at the YMCA. <laughs> the first thing that comes to my mind is gay sex when you say YMCA. So, I, I, guess we'll, of the I guess we'll piss 
continues to do research into this. On cupcakes? Yeah, I just wanted to. She wants to look at the cupcakes. 134 Must vanilla cakes with green frosting. Cupcakes. Yep. With the letter A oh, on them. 134 kind of vanilla like... cakes with blue. Iced with the letter B. No matter B. Which, which color you choose, all the endings are delicious. Right. I mean, they're cupcakes. You just cupcakes ruined your awesome. own point. And 134 vanilla cakes with red icing with the letter C on them. You know what? If I were Bioware, I would have baked a giant cake and then uh, in icing written, uh, no matter what slice you choose, it's all been pretty good. And just take a picture of that and post it to their website. Cupcakes are like pizza. Even bad cupcakes are good cupcakes. Right. I do find it really annoying that um, the Better Business Bureau has given in to the Mass Effect complainers in admitting that, yeah, Bioware false or uh, EA false adver- or falsely advertised this game. I think that's crap. Because yeah, I don't it, feel like it, I've been lied to in any way by the box. Yeah, I, I still think that the my, my trying to get the Federal Trade Commission on them was bullshit. Yeah. I still think that... I, I feel that I my like choices in Mass Effect have been represented. I don't think that I got to the ending by just... Yep, this is where Bioware led you. I got to the ending I did because I raised enough military uh, forces to get the ending that I did. As a storyteller, oh, once you reach a certain point... You can't deviate anymore. You're going to end the story in a way that you've written. False advertising as a civil complaint, uh, from a lawsuit perspective, has to have damages associated with right. it. Right. So being even a, if being they're butt hurt about your game some isn't a damage. Were misled to purchase it based on false claims by the marketing. How many of those people were severely misled by these somewhat obscure marketing quotes they have? And what is the dollar total of that false advertising damages? Right. It's not very much. It's a really great protest to send the people you're mad at delicious food. Can someone remind me to send PayPal a delicious cake? <laughs> Wait, but PayPal actually are douches, whereas Bioware is pretty cool. Bioware just making a game that they thought you would like. Yeah, they can clarify some stuff, and they coolly said that they were going to do it. Yeah, if you want so, to tack some I, extra crap on the end, I'm okay with that. It's just Don't change the ending. Yeah. I would, I would I love an epilogue. I would right. fucking love an epilogue. Yeah, I would Two like to know how are very what things I did. About this DLC, one of which is that it absolutely has to be free, Yeah, because otherwise no. it would destroy the video games industry. Yes. But you it is. You can't and charge so, for that. All good on this front. And then the other thing is that it absolutely has to adhere to the creative integrity of the original ending. Right. Which they claim very adamantly that it is, so... With those two concerns satisfied... We'll we'll have to see what it ends up being. So, I guess we can move on, because I've got League stuff. So much League stuff. Your League stuff is going to have to wait till the end. Oh, why? Yeah, why? We do League all the time. No, You're like, we've been doing Mass Effect for a month, so <laughs> let him have his league. Okay, we've already talk talked league. about the Canadian glow in the dark dinosaur quarters. Yeah, so I don't know do... what else you've got. This I is... have Breath of Death Seven and Cthulhu Saves the World. Oh, sounds like those are waiting until the end. So league. Okay, so um, in a rather weird twist, Riot has decided to outsource their champ development, or not the development, but the the promotion. So in a, in a uh, beautiful bit of of crossover work, they uh, commissioned out for Gabe and Tycho of Penny Arcade to create the special edition previews of the newest champion, uh, Varus, the Arrow of Retribution, a shadow-based uh, AD carry character. Uh, they have an, a one-page comic created by Gabe up on the site, as well as, and this is what really shocked fans, a new judgment. We all thought they were kind of done with those, right? What was this? The judgment written by Tycho? Yes. I didn't see the judgment, but I saw the news post on Penny Arcade that was Tycho talking about how he liked judgments. No, he actually wrote a judgment for Varus. Exciting. Right, and and it turns out to be pretty cool. Yeah, so we finally have a new judgment. Admitted, we're still missing some for some critical characters. Like, I would love to see Lulu's judgment. I think that would be so funny. 
Because you just see all of the League head summoners interviewing a crazy person. Someone who thinks purple has a, a taste. It totally does. There doesn't seem to be any indication that this is representative of judgments coming back in general. I know, it and that's the seems sad like thing. This is just a one-off, and then there won't be any more. Which I am disappointed about as well. Right, I like judgments. I like knowing why my champs are there and getting a view of who these people are. I think the Graves one was amazing because it brought in his relationship with Twisted Fate. Um, I, I really want to see one for Shivana. I think that'd be really cool. Um, the, just anything that establishes that Le the League of Legends is really just the biggest insane asylum that this kingdom can ha uh, hope for. Like, we're going to take all of these crazy, clearly dangerous people and let them fight each other all day long, because at least then they're not going to be destroying everything. You know, they, well, That's they, a pretty good solution. They have a couple sane people. Like, I'm pretty sure Garen isn't really off the deep end, and likewise most of the Demacian champions, but, like, there are some real maniacs in the league list. Cho'gath is trying to destroy the world. That's why he's there. Kog'Maw could destroy the world if left unchecked. But we're... I don't want to see Shuma Gorath as a league champion. We pretty much Frank already West. have it. There's no question. We already have Shuma Gorath. It is a combination of Kog'Maw and, uh, and Cho'gath. There are people in the league who fight daily who want to destroy the planet. Victor is the origin of the Cybermen in Doctor Who. He is a person who wants to upgrade all life to be cybernetic. So the Borg. Or the Cybermen, yeah. I don't think you watch much Doctor Who. Or not any much. of it. Not a lot. Right. Like, Victor is not a good person, nor are most of the League champs. I think all of the Noxus champs who aren't undead are horrible bastards. Right, I'm announcing Nerd Talk's new game project. A MOBA starring, like, a ridiculous cast of licensed characters. I want, I want like, Superman as, as, a, as a champion. We're so and Batman get sued. And Frank West. No idea how we're getting all these licenses, but we're making this game. As long as you're not selling it for profit, you don't need to acquire the license. <laughs> yeah, except that that's not true. Yeah, yep. You do. You get cease and desists and whatnot. Ponies from MLP. Who would you put in your all-star MOBA? Shepard. <laughs> Shepard. Actually, Rex. no. Forget Shepard because you can't, because the people who like FemShep would be, why did you put ManShep? And the people who like ManShep would be, who is that? <laughs> uh, just on the champion select screen? I mean, when you select most champions, it's just like Superman, lock in, you're done. Yeah, but when Superman, you're like Shepard, you it says Shepard, and then it does the whole character creation screen. Oh my god. Before so you hit lock uh, in. That'd be horrible. No, but <laughs> in, instead of Shepard, let's do like Garrus. Or Grunt. Or Grunt. Grunt or would Rex. be Rex. Or... I, I think that if you have Shepard versus Rex in this game, that they just freeze up for a while and go, Shepard, Rex, Shepard, Rex, you just, Shepard. You get to push <laughs> either one button or another, and it determines whether you shot him on Vermeer. They have special passives that annihilate with each other. Right. And stunlock each other. No, I I, I like the idea. I think it, it, it would never happen, but it would be neat. Because you could just endlessly keep adding characters from other franchises. I mean, uh, obviously you'd want, like, Dante from Devil May Cry. Because why not? He's pretty good in Marvel vs. Capcom. It's Cyclops. Actually, we're pretty much just going to have to throw all Marvel vs. Yeah, Capcom all of Marvel vs. Capcom could be in. But no, we, we could expand out into other comics. I mean, like, I, I could definitely see Spider-Jerusalem being hilarious. He, he shoots you with a ray gun and you poop yourself. <laughs> Exhibit from Pimp My Ride. Or Cribs. <laughs> Whatever he's from. I got some champ in your ride. champ so you could champ? Yes. It's perfect. It's his passive is he puts things in other things. Instead of any Games Workshop characters, we just added a Space Marine because that's pretty much all we've got these days. Miniature joke. A miniature Reaper. You can totally have like a like a for some reason, six foot tall Reaper as a champion. You know, you can have awesome. that if you're playing the Xbox 360. You can have that chase your avatar around. All right, we're going to make this. It's coming out next week. <laughs> Buy it for 20 bucks. Pyro is oh. not going to sleep for two months, and we'll get a week's worth of work done. Um, I'm, I'm not going to not sleep for two months, but I'm going to be, like, in a time dimension, so right. I'm going to spend those We are officially pulling a Dragon Ball. So that it can come out. The, the time meditation chamber thing. 
Train for Burned. a year in the span of three days. So back That's on the topic weird. of Varus. <laughs> you guys are so um, weird. So what we have here is an AD carry who has an odd collection of skills that, according to the people who played the initial test games at PAX, is entirely broken and likely to be the most powerful AD carry in the game, at least upon release. Which is just like every other AD carry that's been released. Yeah, um, people are still afraid of Graves, and that's not going to change. They have nerfed that man in most of the patches since his release, and he's still good. Um, also coming out this week, we have Hecarim whenever Riot gets around to releasing the patch. Um, they've been claiming that some last-minute delays and bug fixes have caused them to hold back on the patch, which has led fans to wonder, are we just going to get two champs in one patch? Something I kind of doubt. But you never know. Two champs and Magma Chamber. Yep. All next patch. We, we have no way of first. knowing. Speaking of patches... Yep, go ahead. I'm done with League stuff for now. The new Star Wars The Old Republic uh, patch is coming out tomorrow... Provided we have no last-minute delays. I'm trying to find my authenticator right now so that I can get a more specific time. <laughs> Which, considering that they've had this up on their public tests for the better part of a month, I would hope that there's no last-minute bug fixes that need to be done that cause this to get delayed further, because I want to start experimenting with the, uh, with the legacy system. I'm totally interested in that. I was really disappointed when you said that uh, you had canceled your subscription because... I was like, oh, who am I going to go crafting with? Um, I re-upped it recently. I meant, My I meant subscription Pyro. has also lapsed, and I'm slightly tempted upon knowing that this big patch is coming out to sign back up just for the reason of seeing if I'm able to complete my final quest as my main character. And I'm not interested in playing the game, I'm just idly curious if they fixed that and made it possible to Servers get the are going to be down for line. quite a while tomorrow. They'll be performing maintenance for eight hours, starting at midnight, so tonight. Pacific time. Central. Oh, That's yep. a C. Oh, cool. They actually modify that based on where you are. Sweet. Until 8 a.m. Central. So. Uh, all right. So the hours I am actively sleeping. Awesome. Ideal. In preparation for our second major game update, Legacy. All game servers will be offline during this period. Maintenance is expected to take no more than eight hours, but could be extended. Dun -dun. Oh, well. It's the largest patch in the game's history, so why not? I'm looking forward to it. I, I'm totally planning on spending some time... You guys have to come back! I already re-upped my subscription because I didn't want to do it on the day the patch came out. I'll probably buy a 30-day code just to finish my storyline. Probably. Or to play on our Jedi. My Jedi's been very okay. lonely sitting in that bar <laughs> all by herself. <laughs> she has drank so much blue milk. <laughs> Too much nerf milk. It'll make you sick. So yeah. It sounds like a pretty good patch. Totally looking forward to it. Alright, so you've got reviews to do. No, nope, that's at the end now, since we decided it wasn't in the middle. Do we have more? GameStop lost a lawsuit in California a few days ago saying that they need to more clearly label used games that came with DLC codes in the new boxes. And that they need to pay out damages as a a uh, class action lawsuit thing for games they have sold already used that had Project Den $10 style codes. What? I... Really? Damages for this? What? Damages? I'm sorry. Can we... Can we... What? <laughs> you're the jackass who's buying a used game knowing that you're buying a used game. And yeah. I'd like to think that everyone on Earth... That's, that's like now... buying the used game and then getting pissed that, you know, the person who sold it back to the company didn't leave the book... You know? Yeah. Like, you know, as doing this, that the company that made the game does not get the money. I assume that the entire gaming community knows this by now. If well, you buy the used game, clearly you're making the statement that, I do not care, I would like a discount on this thing. Or, realistically, you're just super ignorant of the way society works on the back end, and you're only thinking about the immediate moment. And I find that position somewhat defensible, seeing as how the main outcome of this lawsuit is that they need to do better labeling for when they're selling used copies of games that had inbox DLC. Uh, so, if the, the argument that they need better labeling means that the consumers who were buying the used copies didn't know any better. 
Yeah, I'm... St I still find it really hard to believe that there are people who don't know where your money goes when you buy a used game. Or sell a, a used game. It's inevitable that people do not think about things outside their immediate circumstances. People will put acid in the trash can and then be surprised when there's actually a garbage man who has to deal with that trash can. Be like, oh, there's a dude who has to stand there when that thing gets flipped upside down? I didn't even realize that. Oops. <sighs> so, I, I don't have a super big problem with this, because I think the class action payout is not a significant sum of money, and the main outcome is better labeling, which... As an industry pundit, I know very well when I'm buying a game that had inbox DLC. Yeah, absolutely. And additionally, as a private individual, I haven't bought a used game in, like, years. Yeah, likewise, the, the if we're specifically talking about the EA initiative of putting the online code into each game, they offer you the chance to get it. Yes, they do. You can buy the online code separately. It'd be one thing if this content was entirely unavailable. Uh-huh. But it's not. Which would also be super douchey by the publishers, by right. the way. But, yeah, it's it's available for a relatively nominal fee. Like, it's not even a big sum of money to get access to the Cerberus network if yeah. you didn't buy it. I, I mean, say what you will about EA as a company, but they have been incredibly fair with their DLC. Uh-huh. Even the stuff that was, like, exclusive to the collector's edition of The Old Republic. There is not a piece of that that I could not get inside of the game if I really wanted to. If I felt like buying the digital collector's edition, I could have every piece of extra content that Pix got for buying the collector's edition of that game. Uh-huh. If I feel like uh, getting the Mass Effect 3 content that came with the collector's edition, I can buy Javik. If I happen to buy a used copy of the game, I can buy access to the Alliance network. Yep. The reason I personally haven't bought any used games in a long time is not even really any ideological reason. It's just that I buy all of my games from Steam, and it is so convenient and so cheap, even, to buy games from Steam that I have no incentive to buy used games. Because games that are not brand new, and even sometimes games that are brand new, go on crazy sales on Steam all the time. Right. And so, if you're on the lookout, you can get discounts comparable to what you could get by buying used. I just try not but to buy used games because I don't like the practice. All of your money, in that case, goes to the creators Not everybody's quite so principled. <laughs> you and I both know people, Sen, who, uh acquires their media in less than tasteful ways. Right. Oh, it... Used is a funny gap between new and piracy, because it's the people who are paying for something, but not giving their money to the creators. Yeah, I, and it's like, I, I just have this principle with myself that, hmm, I should give the money that I make to the people who make the things I like, so they keep making more things that I like. Uh, used games are kind of the worst for both I worlds also, in that I respect also, you know, because. Sorry, you, you go ahead. I'll, like, because the creators don't get any of the money, and the consumer still has to pay. Right. And there's just this middleman who's leashing off of society that you're feeding as a result of you, this. You can't really justify giving ten extra dollars <laughs> knowing that that money will be going to the people who made the thing. It's not like you save a whole bunch going to a retail location and getting used any. It's not like you really needed the pizza, fatty. Give the extra and ten bucks. I, I like the idea of parents being able to show the stuff they own to their kids, because as a kid, I played a lot of my dad's video games and listened to a lot of my mom's music. And from a legal situation, when you're abrogating the uh, doctrine of first sale and things like that, it all becomes super gray, uh, transferring to family members and... The family members who are not yeah. related by blood and yep. stuff. And see, we're not nearly that old or in that stage of life to be considering this, but, like, I listen to it on the Rooster Teeth podcast, where, like, they'll talk about, okay, well, you know, we've got so many Xboxes laying around the house for, like, himself and his wife and his kids or whatever. Who gets the DLC when I get the stuff for pre-ordering or whatever? <laughs> That's an interesting so, thing. It's a touchy issue, and you can't just go ham-fistedly saying, 
used sales are illegal because it, it's a bit complicated. But from this perspective, I think Project Ten Dollar is actually pretty great. Yeah, a relatively cheap inbox DLC for new copies. That if you buy used ones, you can get another license to the DLC. And it's all good. And the main content is actually the main content. It's, it's also like, a really good, you know, incentive for doing stuff like pre-orders and stuff like that. And uh -huh. I really like those, like, little pre-order incentives. That, oh, you get this DLC for free or you $10. get this DLC earlier or whatever. Missing out on Project $10 codes does not really neuter the main video games in any way. If you play Arkham City without the Catwoman content, there's still a lot of game there, and a lot of interesting game there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just get a little extra. Yeah, well. it's- or like, you know, there, there are some games that where I guess it cuts out the multiplayer or whatever, which isn't necessary. That's- that's a bit bigger, and also kind of more complicated because there's upkeep costs. Yep, that is my computer deciding it wanted to talk right now. There are upkeep costs associated with running multiplayer servers, but then again, you're probably also paying for that already in the form of Xbox Live Gold subscriptions. I, I feel like neutering the multiplayer with codes is a fairly severe damage to the game, but in general, I think Project $10 is pretty good and works pretty well. I think GameStop requiring to label games that have that sort of stuff when they're selling them used is fine, because, I mean, it's just a label. And GameStop is going to die soon anyway, because digital distribution will rule the world. Yep. So I, I do have kind of an interesting story to share. And this is another way-to-go industry thing. So after taking quite a bit of flack throughout the years, um, Ubisoft has stepped up and, and done something unique with the proposed DRM for the third Assassin's Creed game. Really? I haven't heard this. And this is totally my wheelhouse. Right. Hang on. I'm Nerdtalk's official your Assassin's Creed correspondent. It's on my business cards. Right. I, I figured you Did you write that in on the back? <laughs> yes, with a pen. That's not actually on my business cards, unfortunately. Right. But please tell the story. So this is something that I initially got from watching uh, the checkpoint on the Penny Arcade TV w website. And I'm trying to back it up with some additional research. But supposedly what's going to be coming soon is when Assassin's Creed 3 releases, they've decided to do away with the DRM. Like, totally? Yes. Rather than punish the people who have legitimately acquired their game, it makes more sense to DRM-free it and provide rewards and incentives to make fans want to legitimately acquire the game. I find this very difficult to believe. Right, because this is coming from Ubisoft. Ubisoft, the, the people who practically pioneered always on DRM for your favorite games. Because if you disconnect, we don't want you to have that save. All right, I'm going to look up this, uh, what was it, a Checkpoint episode? This is the most recent Checkpoint episode on Penny Arcade TV. All right, let's, let's take a break. I'm going to edit this part out because I'm going to do more research on this. This looks pretty promising, but the thing I always kind of worry about when they talk about rewarding legitimate consumers rather than punishing pirates is those sort of wind up being similar things in the case of misidentification, because I personally uh, ha am on a lot of different computers all the time, and I wipe my computer and have to reinstall software fairly frequently, so I am likely to be misidentified as a pirate by games I have purchased. Situations like the uh, Batman DRM, I, I don't remember it specifically, but there was a Batman game that had DRM that made Batman walk really slowly if it thought you were a pirate. Yeah. And the way that would work in case of misidentification is just that there's some person who paid money to the creators to play this game, and then they're like, wow, this game really sucks, because it's punishing me for being a pirate, except I'm not, and then all I think is this game is really crappy, I should tell my friends not to buy it. Why can't Batman run? Uh, the gist I'm getting from these stories is that they are saying there's really good community support, which would be real live people, and... That is much more proof against misidentification than 
automated systems. So if, if you're like on the forums and stuff and that rewards you for having a Uplay account, then that's sort of great because there's no... That doesn't go bad if you're misidentified. Right. This is not all like super solid confirmation that future Ubisoft games are going to come out in a form that if I'm on, a, if I'm changing to a different computer, I can just copy my Assassin's Creed 3 folder from my old computer to my new computer, and it'll just work on my new computer no problem. That's sort of vague philosophical statements on Ubisoft's part. So, it, it is plausible that there will still be DRM, and probably DRM of the Steam style, which I'm okay with it. I've actually personally never fallen afoul of Steam DRM, and I'm sort of the crazy edge case consumer that's most likely to fall afoul of DRM. Right. What are you no. watching? I am currently watching the launch trailer for the uh, PlayStation Network and 360 uh, release of Skullgirls, a fighting game designed by fighting game players. One of two games that we're going to talk about this show that I won't be able to play because it's not available on PC. Right. But that I think is kind of cool looking. It's a neat art style, I'll give it that. I, I like that the system was actually built by professional fighting game players and designed for deep core mechanics, despite its extremely cartoony art style. That's a little bit over my head there. Alright, so let's go ahead and do your reviews. We're at no, the end the other, of the show. The other game that has a cool art style that's only coming out for consoles is Fez which is out on XBLA this Friday. Right, and I, a, which I will be picking up this Friday. 2D platformer that is actually 3D, and you control your platforming by rotating the camera, in part. Well, that looks really cool. I'm going to link the trailer to that underneath the video, because it is compelling on a visual level. Yep. It's just a pretty game. And you will hear more about that from us in the future. Mm-hmm. Poacher got an update. Uh over the course of the last week, that had achievements. This is Yahtzee's free Metroidvania 2D platformer. In which you fight and... killer bunnies. Yes. And Yahtzee, it's gotten a lot of flack for being hard, and that is well justified because this game is freaking hard. It's really hard. And Yahtzee posted on his Twitter that it gets easier after you beat the library level. And he is just a dirty liar because I beat the library level and it is still really, really hard. Maybe he was trolling you. It, it is entirely possible he was trolling you. To the extent that I got to about two levels past the library section, and I'm like, okay, what I'm going to do is open a memory editor and attach it to this process and then memory edit such that I have infinite health and I don't take damage. And so, even with infinite health and not taking damage... It was still kind of a fairly challenging platformer. Just the jumping around and getting to your destination is hard, without having to worry about being killed all the time. So, I, I think Poacher is a lot of fun, and it'll last you a long time if you play it 30 minutes at a time without cheating. Okay. I, I hope you're uh, a can, masochist. Can, can I redirect us for just a second? Sure. Because now I'm on TV tropes looking at the wild mass guessing. She has, she has been doing this since you originally mentioned the wild mass gaming trope thing. Guessing. And anyway, I'm on the WMG page, which is admittedly short for Minesweeper. <laughs> okay, so who is a Time Lord in Minesweeper? Is it the smiley face? The smiley face is a Time Lord. The yellow face is a guy with a jaundice. What? <laughs> So yeah, th that is the reason the indoctrination theory is boring to me, is that it's a lot like something that exists in all other games. Right. It's like everything is radically different than it seems, and you have to not pay attention to all the actual substance of the game. So I'm reading an article on GameSpot right now that Namco Bandai has announced a new Dragon Ball Z fighting game for the 360 to come out later this year. And the real kicker here is that it has Kinect support. I'm just imagining a game where you have to stand at shoulder width apart and scream at your television in order to continue. <laughs> Raise your power level. Oh, I pooped myself. 
it needs to be just like a really frustrating game. So you'd just be screaming at your console anyway because you're like, oh god, this the, is so the annoying. The louder you scream, the better and your character is. And it'll take is. you over 9,000. <laughs> it's a game that you cannot play in like apartments with cardboard walls because it'll really annoy your building mates. It's perfect. I like it. Okay, finally, the games I played over this week yes. are Breath of Death 7 and Cthulhu Saves the World, which I've played partly in celebration of the fact that Zeboid, the developers of those games, are going to be making the Penny Arcade Adventures 3, and also because Steam had the bundle of those two games on sale for $2. I was like, heck yeah. Yay, $2. So, these two games are extremely similar, and their mechanics are straight out of Final Fantasy IV and or Dragon Warrior. It's turn-based combat that with random encounters, and when you're in a combat, the background fades away, and it takes place just on a black background, which is, is traditional and also kind of boring, but it actually works more than I'd expect it to. I am a person who always likes to have a lot of assets in games. That's what I want more out of The Old Republic, is just more environments and more backgrounds and stuff. But that is a triple-A, multi-million dollar development game, whereas these two are like super small indie projects by one to two to persons. And so I, I, I forgive them for it a lot, and actually, it's pretty fun. The tactics of the battle mechanics are interesting. There's spells, attacks, uh, summons, combination moves that use the turns of more than one of your characters at a time. And they give you a lot of those things right out of the gate. At the end of every battle, you recoup your health fully, but not your MP. You recoup a little bit of MP. It's all very interesting combat, which I think will be very good in a new Rain Slick game. But the writing for these games, it is really dang silly, you guys. Like, well, yeah. it, is, it is too silly for me. I guess you should sort of have an idea of this from the fact that Cthulhu saves the world is titled Cthulhu Saves the World, uh -huh. and in it, Cthulhu is the good guy. That is already pretty silly. But yeah. let me just give you a picture of the opening cutscene of Cthulhu Saves the World. All right, uh, like, give me a second to mentally prepare myself. Cthulhu right, well, saves the world. You're going to go insane world. no matter what. Cthulhu. All right. Madness. <laughs> okay, Cthulhu is asleep under the ocean like he does, and then he wakes up and is going to destroy everything like he does. And then some wizard takes away all his powers. And it's like Cthulhu is going, what the heck? All my powers are gone. And then the narrator is doing voiceover that says, little did Cthulhu know, to get all his powers back, he would have to become a true hero. That's basically like Disney's Hercules. And then Cthulhu says, haha, silly narrator. Little did you know, I was reading the narration. And now I know I have to become a true hero. And... So, Cthulhu sets off on his quest to become a true hero, and he encounters a damsel in distress on the beach. It was just this lady being attacked by, like, squid monsters. And I've seen enough like, hentai oh. to know which where this Cthulhu, is going! Which Cthulhu is a squid monster. Okay, so Cthulhu kills the squid monsters and saves the damsel in distress, at which point the damsel in distress immediately falls madly in love with him. And it's like... there's It pops up an image that is like, most people see Cthulhu like this, and he's a horrifying monster. But this girl sees Cthulhu like this, and he's like a rugged hero. And then she's like, oh, you're so dreamy. I love you. I want to I wanna adventure with you. And then Cthulhu was like, get away, stupid mortal. I'm not interested in you. And she's like, I don't care. I'm still madly in love with you. And it says, character name forced her way into your party. And then you go adventuring together. And then you fight some true heroes who are actually, like, good guys, but you fight them anyway because Cthulhu is short-tempered. It's... It has a lot of... This is all sounding better than it actually sounded to me when I was playing it as I'm describing it. Right. And there was one... The one joke I will give these games credit for being super funny is that if you go into the controller menu, it's like configure keyboard, uh, configure 360 controller, and configure Thoughtotron 6000... And if you go to configure Thoughtotron 3000, it's like, please think your desired settings into the Thoughtotron, and then press confirm. And I'm like, okay, that's pretty funny. So $2, good old-school JRPG combat and map exploration. Really silly, 
the main characters are dumb, bad people. And I would have liked these games a lot if the main characters weren't, you know, dumb and bad people. But if the writing in Rain Slick 3 is Tycho's writing, then I am going to like Rain Slick 3 a ton. And if the writing in Rain Slick 3 is Zeboid writing, I'm not going to like it at all. All right, then. We will see. All right, and our other game for this week. There's more. More. Is there? This podcast is going to be like 10 hours long. 15, 20. Do you want to look at other stuff? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, we're going to talk about it. Yep. Lollipop Chainsaw. Okay. There's a preview at PAX East, which happened last week. Yep. Oh, PAX East. I thought you said PAX Feast at first. And I was the like, PAX there was feast. a feast? <laughs> well, it was over Easter, so, I mean, maybe there were... Wait, the, there was a PAX East on Easter that, that continues to become hilarious. Anyway, so yeah, Lollipop Chainsaw. You both suck for making me play it. <laughs> it just hasn't even come out yet. I'm just going to declare this. That's going to be the best extended Let's Play we've ever done. So what, are we going to like also the do only Let's Plays? Extended let's play. Well, kind of. Like, I don't even, I still don't even know how logistically that's going to work. Are we going to have to, like, play the whole thing then, or? Yep, start to finish, all of it. Endurance run. Forget 200 fans, we're doing this. It's guaranteed. Just like that MOBA that we're releasing <laughs> next week. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> the Nerd Talk MOBA, with all of the memes. Including this dinosaur from this glow-in-the-dark Canadian quarter. It's going to be a one character. of the champions. One of the champs. It's gonna be better than Superman. His ult is gonna definitely be better that, than Aquaman. But his ult is just gonna be like Nox's ult, and it turns out the lights, and then he's glow in the dark, and he's a skeleton monster now because when he's glowing, so he's a skeleton. Like, so like so you turn off the lights, and then he becomes like Chogath. Superman's yes, ult so is just he pushes thing. the earth into the sun, isn't it? Superman's ult is that he spins no, around the earth. No, it's really it's fast, he waits until you're losing. Time to the beginning no, wait, of the wait, match. wait, wait. He waits until he, he waits until his team is losing, and then he spins around the earth really fast, and then reverses everything so it's the other team that's losing, and then he wins. Okay, actually, no, it's just like a it's just like a one minute rewind. I, I just like figured he would style. fly around the work the earth until all of the other champions were small children, and then fly up and punch them. <laughs> just punch babies. Right. Superman punching babies. The video game <laughs> of the movie. We gotta make the movie first, then. You can't picture Superman as a giant dick in high school just flying around and griefing the kids he doesn't like when they were children? <laughs> that makes sense to me. Isn't that the entirety of Smallville? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty <laughs> Perfect. Done. Let's go watch it. Uh, also, I guess there's a Google Plus redesign. Shows how much for yes. I've been paying. Because the first one doesn't work. Well, the redesign was only showed up on user pages as of like an hour ago. It's brand new. Yay. That explains some things. I don't think the app changed, though, because the app still looks the same. The so, app yeah. did not change, just the web interface. So we're currently at an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah, deal yep. with it. We're, we've also got a whole bunch of fluff to cut out, though, too. Right. I don't know. I'm out. I've got one. Do it. Oh, we, okay, we so have... what are we doing next week? Um... Can I just play no more Mass Effect? Can I just play Street Fighter Cross Tekken for a few days? I suppose we haven't done an official review for that yet. Yeah, we did. Did we? Yeah. I thought we just did a first look. Yeah, it was as close to a full as we were getting with the fighting game because literally there's not much that can be done. I didn't think Said we'd we'll probably play Fez a bit. I will yeah. most. Oh my God, Privateer! I hate you slightly less right now. What? They finally announced uh, the continuing releases from last year's book. We finally have the second Warjack chassis for Menoth coming out. You don't play Menoth. I don't, but I'm excited that progress is Anymore. being made. Because eventually the Signar and Cawdor boxes are coming out, because they're the next ones. They're all that's left. We already have the announcement of the next Privateer book. The next War Machine book. And they still haven't put out all the shit from the last one. We'll say I'm not too much a fan of the sculpt, though. I'm closing my tabs because we're wrapping up the show, and I have this news story about the Canadian Quarter open in four different tabs. 
It's I really wanted to talk is. about that quarter. It's a dinosaur that glows in the dark. Yeah, that's on a, a quarter. Really ugly warjack kit. So yeah. In summary, this has been Nerd Talk for this fine April eleventh, two thousand twelve. I should check the date before I start doing that. Indeed. <laughs> We'll be recording next week. And, uh, I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And I'm Paris. Him. Oh my god, I forgot the announcement for this week. I'm going to be at C2E2. Oh, you got your pass too. Yes. We're going to be at C2E2. So I guess you can come say hi to us when we go to C2E2. <laughs> I will personally insult anyone who asks me to. <laughs> and a few people who don't. <laughs> because I don't get to swear very often. Fuck y'all dickbags. We're out. <laughs> He will also be insulting several chairs that he walks past. <laughs> anyway, that's it. We'll see you guys at C2E2. Good night.